It says this in Romans 10, 14. How can they call on the one in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone to preach? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. And I think it's always just a great reminder that God uses vessels to preach the good news. And for us to see that every time the word of God is opened, when someone is behind this pulpit or when you're sharing it with someone out and about wherever you go, that it's God speaking through you. And so many times we can look to human vessels and human things and not honor it properly. And when we don't honor it properly, we don't receive it properly the way it's supposed to. So I just wanted to honor um, Miss Erin and we're so thankful for the gift that you are. So, all right. I'm so glad she said that because uh, Rodney asked me twice now. He goes, are you ready? And I said, as ready as I'm ever going to be. I said, I said, I did my part. And I said, God has to give his part. Otherwise, it's going to be very boring for you guys. But he's always faithful. And when I recognize that, um, that he's the one, it's his word. And all I have to do is present it to you guys. And I love talking about his word. And so um, I may be a little bit scattered tonight, but you guys can follow me, right? Yeah. Okay. Because... Uh, just do what they have good practice he said <laughs> um so probably last week sometime I was you know all right you know the same way I do with when I'm writing curriculum or whatever I'm doing I really have to wait until the inspiration comes I just can't just sit down and just start writing something out and I can I can sit down in the anybody can sit down in the bible and start studying something and study out something but I really, when I teach up here, I really want to know exactly what God wants to minister that night to you guys. And so I was just waiting on God to speak to me, and days were ticking by, and I was down to like last Saturday, last this past Saturday, and um, he just, the way he speaks to me is he'll just speak, usually it's just a word or a, or a phrase or something, and I will start to meditate and play it out and think about it and and then I'll begin to study it out through the word. And um, it came it came through a lot of just crud, you know. You know the devil is really good. He knows he knows his job. Do y'all know that? He's really good at his job. But praise God, we've overcome because of what Jesus did, right? But he is good at his job, which is why we should be very keen and very aware of his tactics. And I did know his tactics. And I know every time I teach, whether it's in here or kids or wherever, or anytime I'm ministering or speaking or sharing God's word, he doesn't like it. And so he's going to, he's going to attack in whatever ways he can. And this week it was just, you know, a constant battle of casting my cares, casting my cares, casting my cares. I still, this was years and years ago when Pastor Evan taught this message. And I remember her standing here, holding her hands up, you know, cast in her care, and I, I picture that every time when I'm dealing with it, of casting my care on him, and so it was just constant all week long, um, but thank God, we persevere, we continue to do it, I mean, what choice, what choice do we have, right, are we going to lay down, and just say, okay, I'm just going to dwell on it all, the, you know, all day long, all night long, I'm going to dwell on what you're feeding me, Satan, no, we cast our care, and so um, before we get started tonight, I just want to pray and, and do that. Is that okay with you guys? All right. So, Father, I just thank you so much for how good and how faithful you are. God, I thank you that your word is truth. It's the standard we live by. We believe you and we believe every word in it. So, Father, right now, we just cast our care on you. Anything that, that has us bound up, anything that our mind is dwelling on, anything that our heart is torn about, Father, I just we just cast it on you. Because your word said you care for us. You care for us. You go before us. You go behind us. You take care of it. You're out in our future. You're already aware. You're already there. And so, Father, we cast our care on you tonight. We open up our hearts to hear your word and to hear your direction in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, I was, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about social media, which... I have a love-hate relationship with social media anyway. Um, how many of you are on several sites? 
I don't know. People that are old like me are on, like, Facebook. That's about it. My kids make fun of me because they're like, you're still on Facebook? But that's pretty much all I'm on. And I'll occasionally get on Instagram, but I really don't know what I'm doing on it, so I don't ever post on Instagram. I honestly don't even know. Sometimes my posts will go from Facebook to Instagram, and I don't, I don't know what I did to get them there. You know, I'm just like, oh, wow, it's on Facebook. Okay, yay. So people are like, you didn't accept my friend request on Instagram. I'm like, I don't know how to do that. You know, I just don't. So I'm just strictly on Facebook, and my um, my daughter stays off Facebook. She hates Facebook um, because she is aware of what um, plants things in her mind and battles she has. And Facebook is one of them that can plant fear, you know, if you're reading stuff. And so she just stays off of it most of the time. So any, any videos or anything I get online is through Snapchat. And if you think I don't understand Instagram, I really don't understand Snapchat. I don't even know half, how to get half the videos she sends me. But Anyway, so I know very little about it, so if I talk inappropriately about it, I'm sorry. I don't really know, but I'm going to use it as an illustration tonight real quick. Um, so with Facebook, there's the like and share button, right? And so when I'm scrolling, I mean, there's lots of things I'll hit like, like. I mean, I like people's stuff that I don't even know. I like, yeah, I, oh, that's good, like, like, like. And occasionally, if I really like it, I will share it. If I really like it, I have to really like it, you know, to share it. Because I'm like, I don't want to see anything on my Facebook page, you know. So I will share it occasionally. And I know with Instagram, and this is where y'all may laugh at me, but it's, uh, you have the ability to follow. Is that, is that the word, terminology? You follow people, and they can request to follow you back. So there's people I follow, my friends, people in church, whatever. And then some people will request to follow me, and I'll approve them, even though I don't always know them. And it'll say, do you want to follow them back? And I'm like, I don't know them, so I don't follow them back. Anyway, um, so if I don't ever follow you, it's because I don't know you yet. I need to get to know you, but um, which you don't really care if I follow you probably, but that's okay. Um, but, I, but I know that there's also the follow button is when you um, – I think it's, I think you can even do this on Facebook. I don't know. Anyway, people you really, really, really want to like, want to follow or whatever the word is, want to um, see their stuff all the time. You want it to always come up in your feed. You want it to all, you want to always see it. You follow them, right? And most of the time, I don't do, I don't follow very many because I don't want just tons of stuff. I want specific stuff. And sometimes you follow certain groups or certain, whatever you're interested in. I know like some people that follow, that like to cook, follow certain cooks or chefs or whatever, whatever your hobbies are, whatever. I'm sure Pastor Nate follows lots of hunting stuff. I don't know. You're probably not a social media person, but uh, whatever you're into, whatever you enjoy doing, you know, you, you tend to follow. And so I want to talk a little bit about that word tonight, about follow and exactly what it means to follow something. We've been... Um, We've watched all of the seasons of The Chosen. Has anybody else seen that? Oh, love that. Uh, you know, and it is, it's a, just like any other Christian story, it's, um, it's very heavily based on the Bible, but they take their, what's the word? Liberty. They take their liberty, and there's other stuff in there that may not necessarily be in the Word. And however, I have found, I'm like, that's not in the Word. And then I go, and I'm like, oh, that is in the Word. I don't know the Word completely. And because some of the stuff, Josh was like, is that in there? And I'm like, I don't know. Let's look. And a lot of time, a lot of it was. So it's very, it's been so good. And we just finished the last, the, the current season that we're on and watched the last one. And I, if you don't know what it's about, it's about the chosen. It's about Jesus' disciples. It's it's their perspective of everything that was going on during that time. And it, it talks about each individual one. It's really a really good story. And so we've been watching that, and it's been so good. And before I watched that, though, when I would read about the disciples, and I have a tendency, especially for growing up in church all my life, I have a tendency to read stories and kind of gloss over them kind of not really invest. You know, if you pick up a novel for the first time and start reading it, you've never read it before, so you're very, very into it. But then, you know, you try to read it the third time, you're glazing over some of the stuff. It, it's kind of lost its, you know what I mean? Um, and so sometimes when we read God's Word, because we've heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it, it just, you start kind of glossing over some of it. And I know um, when Jesus called his disciples to him, heard it all my life, read it all my life, um, but I've not really thought about exactly what that meant. And when the season starts out, it starts out with him calling his disciples to him. And it's, it goes in, the whole season goes into about their lives. They had lives, y'all. 
You know, I think we forget that. They had lives before Jesus came on the scene. They had families. I mean, it talks about Peter even. He had a mother-in-law, so that means he had a wife. So, I mean, these people had lives, and, and Jesus just walked right into the middle of their life and just, walk, you know, didn't say a whole lot, just walked up to him and said, follow me. I'm not sure if somebody came into my life and did that, I would be able to do exactly what they did because there's not a whole lot more in those scriptures if you look. It doesn't say he sat there and told them, hey, y'all, I'm the son of God, and da-da-da-da-da, and da-da-da-da, and convinced them. There was no convincing. It was, follow me, and they laid down everything and did. And that, that amazes me. That, you know, I, I don't think I've ever stopped to think about what they gave up, what they sacrificed, what they... The, the, the hold they put on their life and the things that matter to them in order to follow Jesus. And so I want to talk about kind of what that looks like because I know for me, there is a lot more following I should be doing and could be doing. I think there's a lot more, um, a lot more to it, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we'll, we'll, we'll move on because I, I want to get to some of that. Um, and so, you know, the disciples, it cost them a lot, you know, and we'll get into that at the end, but it really, it, some of, most of them, it cost them their lives even. So it was a huge sacrifice, and we see this sacrifice, and we see the level of sacrifice that God expects when he asked them uh, to bring the spotless lamb, when they had to bring a lamb every year for forgiveness to atone for their sins. We see that there, that was a sacrifice. They couldn't just bring their leftovers. They had to bring a spotless lamb. Why? Because Jesus, because God wasn't bringing his leftovers. And so he demanded, he didn't demand anything less than what he was willing to do. He gave his ultimate and he gave his very, very best, which of course was Jesus. And Jesus gave his very best. He gave his whole life for us, you know. And so that's the kind of sacrifice we're talking about. So who are we to think that we won't or don't have to do the very same thing? If, he's at, if he did it, if he asked his son to do it, if we are his children, then he is going to ask us to do it. He is asking us to do that. He is asking us for that level of sacrifice. It's a huge sacrifice. It's a huge sacrifice sometimes. Sometimes we sacrifice time. Time, uh, whatever, you know, maybe you're using your gift at church and you're sacrificing your time. I spoke with the worship team a few weeks ago, and I was just, you know, encourage them because there is a lot of time that goes into they don't just come up here pick up an instrument start playing and it's done there is a lot of time that that goes into it as they're preparing for the week they're practicing all throughout the week they're spending just as you are in your in the ways in the way you're serving as well so there's time that we sacrifice and give up to take up our cross and follow him there's time there's energy there's sleep sometimes I know that's sad, isn't it? <laughs> there's desire sometimes, wants. Sometimes there re there's relationships, and there's definitely rights that we give up to follow Jesus, isn't there? I love, I love this that I read today. Um, it was from a holiness pastor. Uh, his name is Dennis Kinlaw, and it says, Satan disguises submission to himself under the ruse of personal autonomy. Let me say it again. He disguises submission to him under the ruse of personal autonomy. He never asks us to become his servants. Satan never asks us to. He doesn't care. He doesn't want us to be his servants. Never once did the serpent say to Eve, I want to be your master. The shift in commitment is never from Christ to evil. It is always from Christ to self. And instead of his will, self-interest now rules and what I want reigns. And that is the essence of sin. So we're going to talk a little bit about what it looks like to really follow him. Because it's, we don't want that. We don't want our self-interest to reign. We don't want what we want. We want what he wants. And because I, I talk, I'm saying a lot about sacrifice. But there's a lot that we get from it. There's a lot, and, and it's, it's a sacrifice, and at the end, we're going to talk about it a little more, but there's a reason for it as well. And so, we are called to take up our cross. What does that mean exactly? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, and this is uh, in the Passion Translation. <clears throat> I'm going to try to go through a lot of scripture tonight, um, but they're short ones, so y'all can stay with me, but just try to stay with me. Um, it says, then, then Jesus said to the, his disciples, if you truly want to follow me, you should at once completely reject and disown your own life. 
And you must be willing to share my cross and experience it as your own as you continually surrender to my ways. So underline that in your Bible, as you continually surrender to my ways, because we're going to talk about that in a minute. For if you choose self-sacrifice and lose your lives for my glory, you will continually discover true life. But if you choose to keep your lives for yourself, you will forfeit what you try to keep. For even if you were to gain all the wealth and power of this world at the cost of your own life, what good would that be? And what could be more valuable to you than your own soul? You know, back in Jesus' times, the disciples did choose to follow him. And there were many that did choose to follow him. But did you know there were many who chose not to? After all they saw and all he did and all he was to them, there were many that chose not to. Uh, Let's go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. And it says, On their way, someone came up to Jesus and said, I want to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Yes, but remember this. Even animals in the field have holes in the ground to sleep in, and birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay down his head. Jesus then turned to another and said, Come be my disciple. He replied, someday I will, Lord, but allow me first to fulfill my duty as a good son and wait until my father passes away. Jesus told him, don't wait for your father's burial. Let those who are already dead wait for death. As for you, go and proclaim everywhere that God's kingdom has arrived. Still another said to him, Lord, I want to follow you too. But first, let me go home and say goodbye to my entire family. Jesus responded, why do you keep looking back to your past and have second thoughts about following me? If you turn back, you are not fit for God's kingdom. So he's given an illustration here. He said that the first person, he said, I want to follow you, Jesus. But Jesus made it very clear to him. He told him there's going to be some sacrifice because he said, I I don't even have a place to lay my head. Are you you ready to come with me? Are you ready to do that? There's, There's going to be a lot. So he's kind of giving him a little heads up. And the next two told Jesus that they wanted to do, they wanted to follow him, but they had something to do first. They wanted, they wanted to follow him, but there was something more important that needed to be done before they did that. And so Jesus is looking for people that put him first, isn't he? Yeah. So let's, uh, let's look at people that didn't. So the first one are his hometown people. We know the story. I'm not going to go to that just for time's sake. But it's found in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. Um, and it talks about, you know, they, it says they scoffed. They said, isn't he Mary's son? Isn't he such and such brother, sister? Isn't he? Oh, it's just him. And the Bible goes on to say that he was able to do very little there because of their, to me, familiarity. They became very familiar with him. They were very familiar. There was no honor. There was, there was nothing there. And so they lost out. And they, they never followed him. Uh, the next one is found in Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Let's go ahead and turn to that one, Mark 10, 17. It says, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked. Only good, only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at him, looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one one thing that you haven't done, he told them. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And at this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. So a lot of times, you know, things, stuff Stuff will keep us from following God, right? And that's what happened with this man. It was, it was just stuff. It was something that was more important to him. It's always something that's more important. It's always something about us. It's always just like that, the, the uh, thing I read earlier. It's always self-interest. What is more important to me? That's always what's going to prevent us from following him the way he wants us to follow him. And the last one is very obvious. I mean, there's, I'm not, there's too many scriptures to even read this, but um, where the Pharisees, 
I mean, they were in complete pride. Did you know pride will keep you from following Jesus? Pride because you don't understand. Pride because that's not the way we've always done it. Pride because that's not the way my mom said. Pride because whatever it is. And that's what the Pharisees were. It was all, that's not the way we've always done it. That's not, that's not right. You're not following the rules. You're not da-da-da-da-da. And they couldn't even see what was right in front of them. There were so many things. I mean, this is just a list of them. They were mad because he ate with tax collectors and sinners. They accused Jesus when his disciples plucked grain to eat on the Sabbath because that was against the law to work on the Sabbath. They plucked grain. Really? Anyway, Jesus was accused of healing on the Sabbath. They were mad because he healed people on the Sabbath. Um, and, And then instead of stoning, which was law back then, a woman that was caught in adultery, Jesus forgave her. They were mad about that. Uh, his father, um, they were mad because his disciples didn't fast the way John the Baptist uh, people fasted. He allowed a sinful woman, woman to touch him and anoint his feet with ointment in her tears. They questioned his authority to forgive sins. They were upset because he did not ritually wash his hands before dinner. And they were ultimately upset because Jesus' ways were so different than what they were accustomed to and what they were comfortable with. And they did not and would not follow him. So there were plenty of people in the Bible that did not follow him. So I'm going to ask you tonight, and I feel like I know what the answer to this is. Are you willing to follow him? I would say probably everybody in here would say yes. And so there's a lot more to it than what we know, and I want to talk about that. So we know, you know, have you ever heard the phrase, know what you're getting into? (laughs) There's a lot to following him. I think sometimes we think we're following him because we come to church and we, you know, love God. But sometimes that's not, I mean, I I love a lot of people, but it doesn't mean I'm following them. Like I said, I like a lot of people on Facebook. I like a lot of the posts, but I'm not following them. Following following denotes imitation. It devotes, it it, it denotes uh, reproduction. If I'm following somebody, I'm wanting to imitate what they're doing. So if I follow a group on Facebook, say I'm a chef and I want to learn, you know, if I'm following them, I'm going to reproduce that. I'm going to imitate that recipe. I'm going to reproduce that recipe until I get it just right. And so when you're following somebody, you're going to imitate them. You know, have you ever watched your little kids, like maybe especially a little boy when he's following dad around and he's trying to walk like dad walks? He's he's even trying to like get in his footsteps and stay in his footsteps. That's exactly what we're called to do. We're called to imitate him and reproduce him, okay? And so if we're not doing that, then we're not following him. If we're not imitating him and we're not reproducing him, we may love him, we may like him, we may share him occasionally, but if we're not imitating his ways the way he does it, because we know his ways are very different, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. His ways are very different than the world's. They're complete backwards, And if we're not imitating and following those ways, then we're not following him the way he needs us to follow him. All right. So um, I want to talk about what it means to take up your cross. You know, a lot of times, have you ever heard somebody say, that's my cross to carry? A lot of times when they say that, it's it's about sickness or something like that. Oh, that's my cross to bear. You know, maybe they're dealing with a sickness or a wayward child or something. That's my cross to bear. That's, that's not accurate, and that's not biblical at all. And so that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about pick up your, take up your cross and, care and, and follow him. It's not that. Um, so in the first century, we, you know, a lot of, how many of you have a necklace that has a cross on it? A lot of people. I mean, that used to be super popular. But in the first century, the cross only meant one thing, and it was death by crucifixion. Did you know that that's where we get the word excruciating from, is from crucifixion? Because it was, there was no other word to describe the awfulness of it other than excruciating. To carry a cross was to face the most painful and humiliating means of death human beings could develop. And bearing a cross meant one was about to die and that one would face ridicule and disgrace along the way. Therefore, Jesus' command to take up your cross and follow me is a call to self-abasement. It's a call to self-sacrifice. Self-abasement means extreme submission to the will or ways of another person. So if we're going to take up our cross, then we, then we have to abase ourselves. 
We have to be completely and totally submitted to someone else's ways of doing things. And sometimes, especially in this community, and uh, not community, but country, in this world, um, it's all about making your own way, doing things your own, you know, make your own decision, be your own man, be your own person. That is completely against what the Word of God says. We don't even belong to ourselves if we're truly followers of Christ. We belong to Him, and He has certain ways He expects us to do things. And certain ways that, that he wants us to do things. And you know what? Sometimes you're not even going to understand why you're doing it. You're not going to understand it. You're, you're, sometimes he's going to expect obedience from you, even if you don't understand. Just like the Pharisees, they could not understand. But this goes against this. This is not the way I was raised. This is not da-da-da. This is not the law. God's going to ask you to do some things according to his word that you're not going to understand up here. And, and he's going to ask you to do some things that, you're not going to want to do a lot, <laughs> a lot. Um, I'm sure there were some things he got asked to do that he didn't want to do. Number one, the cross. And so there's going to be some choices that we're going to have to make. So we're going to talk about the last few minutes here about the ways of God and some of the different ways that he handles things. And if we're going to take up our cross and follow him, we have to know how his kingdom runs. And we have to want his kingdom above everything else. Let's turn to Matthew uh, chapter 13. Matthew 13, 44. <clears throat> and it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. So this is the kingdom. This is the kingdom we're following. This is the way he wants us to follow his kingdom. He wants it to be like a man that found a treasure and sold everything he had because he saw the value in that treasure was far above anything in his life. So he was willing to give up everything he had ever worked for to get that treasure. Same with this man with the, with the pearl. That's the kingdom that Jesus wants us to be a part of. That's the kingdom he's calling us to follow after. And so there's some things in some areas in our lives we're going to talk about. Number one, we're going to talk about, the very first thing we're going to talk about is what pastor's been talking a lot about is money. Did you know God thinks about money totally different than the world thinks about it? Very, very different. If you get into God's word, this is just the tip of the iceberg on some of the scriptures I'm going to share. But he, is, he does not think like the rest of the world thinks. And with us, with us living in the world, even though we're not a part of the world, we're living in the world, we constantly hear things. And I was just telling Mona this the other day about, you know, stress because you don't have this saved. You don't have this. You don't have this retirement. You don't have this. And I'm not saying any of that's bad. But I am saying when that's all we're focusing on because... Who are we thinking about when we're thinking about it? And we're thinking about taking care of us. Then we're going back to what we talked about. We're not taking up our cross. And it's, we're getting over into self-interest. And that's a very dangerous place to get into. And so let's look. I'm going to give you a few scriptures on this that we're going to talk about. Matthew chapter 6, verse 3. And it says, but when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. So, number one, God, it's a humble, it's, it's a humble giving, right? So, we're not, we're not going out. It's not a pride thing. And you know, um, a lot of times you'll see people advertise in uh, businesses or whatever what they've done and how much they've given and how much we've, you know, blessed and how much we've been able to contribute and da-da-da-da-da. And we can do that too. I gave, you know, da-da-da-da-da to whatever. That's, go, that's not what the Bible says here to do. It says, but when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand even know what your right hand is doing. That's, that's pretty tight-lipped, isn't it? Why? I, I would say it keeps us out of pride. It, it causes us to realize that what we gave isn't even ours anyway. All we did, all we were was a vessel that God used to get something to somebody that needed it. And so it keeps us out of pride, realizing that it was ultimately him anyway. Uh, the next one's chapter, I'm sorry, uh, Luke chapter 12. 
I'm sorry, I know I'm like throwing scriptures at you, but it says Luke, uh, in Luke chapter 12, it says, sell your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So the very first thing says, sell your possessions and give to those in need. You don't really see that anymore very often, do we? Because it's, what do I need? What do I, I got to take care of myself. I got to take care, I got to build this house, get this car. I've got to set my life up and then I'll go. That's not what this says. I'm not saying everybody go sell your house and go live on the street. I'm not saying that. But I am saying he's going to ask you to give up some stuff. And that's okay. It is, it is better than okay. There's people in need all around us. There's people in our church that are in need. And you know what? You may, sit, you, know, you may be like me and go, well, I don't know who's in need. And I don't, you know, because nobody, nobody, everybody's got clothes on in here. I don't know. Did you know there's really people in here that are hurting tonight? I know there are. There's people that are hurting in very, very many areas. But because we're talking about money financially, well, how do we know? You have the Holy Spirit? You do. And he'll lead you and he'll guide you to those people. And he'll minister, and, and all it takes is you saying, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll sell that. I'll give that. I'll do whatever it takes to obey and honor what you're asking me to do. Because no one's ever given up more than what Jesus gave up. And he's, he's going to ask us to do the same thing he did. He gave up everything. He didn't even have a place to lay his head, it said. He gave up everything. Okay? So, and I know, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't really go with... The world and the way the world does stuff, it's very opposite. Number three on money, it says, uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. So here we're to, the, we're to honor the Lord with our first fruits. So the very first thing we make, the very first thing of everything. So this goes back to tithing. Did you, did you know tithing is expected? It is required? Does the world understand it? You know, if I didn't tithe every week, do you know how much money I would have left in the month? Do you know how much money I would have? How much money would you have if you didn't tithe? It does not make sense to the world, does it? And you know what? Sometimes it may not even make sense to you. Are we going to do it? It's in God's word. Are we going to follow his ways, his ways of doing it? And pastors, you know, been teaching a lot on, on that and on giving and why we give. And uh, tithing is, is the very first step. Giving that 10% is the very first step. Because don't fool yourself. You're never going to sell a possession to give to somebody if you can't tithe first. And you want to get to that point. I want to get to the point where when I own something, if, if Jesus, if God asked me to give it, I would give it in a heartbeat. I want to get to that point, and so I've got to take some steps to get to that point, point. and tithing is the very first step. If I can't give up 10% of what he gives me, I'm not going to give up a house when he asks me to. I'm not going to give up a car. I'm not going to give up that because, I'm not, I, I, because I will not have proved his faithfulness yet. So when I give up my car, what am I going to drive? Well, you know, I've been tithing my whole life, and every time I tithe, he's met my needs. So I know if I give up this car, he's going to provide something else. But I can't start with the car if I don't start with the tithe. Does that make sense? Um, the next one's Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. And it says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them. Kind of a repeat of that verse, uh, that verse. It says, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy. And thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. This goes back to what I was saying. I'm not against saving and I'm not against retirement. I'm not against any of that. But that is the world's way of doing things. It is. It is what the world said, you, but you've got to take care of yourself. That's what the world says. That's not what God says. 
God, God says, you lean, lean on me, you depend on me. And you know what? Sometimes he might tell you to do that. He might tell you to open a savings account. He might tell you to invest that. He might tell you that. But it's, it goes back to not relying on yourself to provide for yourself when you get turned 65. Does that make sense? It's not your responsibility to do that. It is God's responsibility. Um, okay, so transition out of money. Uh, the next one that we deal with a lot are things with relationships and uh, relationships do not flow. Godly relationships don't flow the way the world does at all. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. It says, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Wow. You know, have you ever heard this, the saying, uh, fool me once, shame on me, or shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me? That's basically saying, okay, I can forgive you once, but I'm not letting that happen again. So I'm not, I'm not going to go there again. And that's the world's way of handling things. Why? Because we're protecting our selves, our self. It goes back to that word, self. We're protecting ourselves. And I remember, and I don't even know if she'll remember this or not, it was a few years ago, Right after we started coming back here, um, uh, you gave me a book, and it was it was something it was about love. I can't remember the title, but it was about love. And I remember you telling me uh, something to the effect I can't remember word for word, but basically being being willing to open yourself up and not not being so closed off and protecting yourself. And see, to me, I thought I was doing the right thing. Because I was keeping myself from getting hurt again. I was keeping myself from whatever it was. And I thought I was doing the right thing. But I was, I, all I was doing was taking care of myself. And I was, not, I was not allowing my heart to be open for God to use and to lead and to guide. And to, if we're constantly protecting ourselves, we're not going to be protecting others. You know? If we're constantly worried about ourselves and just our little household... Our eyes are not going to be out and looking at other people that need us. And so uh, he says, he said, should I just forgive seven times? I mean, he, I think he thought he was like, wow, seven times? And Jesus is like, not even close. You don't even, you don't even understand. That goes completely against the way the world handles things. We're not a forgiving people sometimes. But Christians are called to be forgiving. They're called to forgive, forget, believe the best. All of that stuff. You know, I used to think, I, I struggle with that, believe in the best of people. I struggle with that in the scripture. Remember me saying one of the things you're not going to understand, but you're still supposed to do. I struggled with it because to me, I was being very prudent. If you've proved to me you are a bird, then, then I should not be ignorant to think that you're not going to fly. Does that make sense? I wanted to, I want to be prudent to expect something from you because that's what smart people do. It's not what God says. God says, believe the best of them. The people that have hurt you, believe the best of them. The people that have completely destroyed you, believe the best of them. And it gets even better. We're going to see some other scriptures you're supposed to do for people. But definitely forgiveness. If you are withholding forgiveness from someone in here tonight, if you are holding forgiveness from someone in your life, you are hurting yourselves. You're only hurting yourself. And you're preventing, I say that, you're really not only hurting yourself. You're hurting yourself, but you're hurting all the other people God is wanting to use you to reach because you're caught up in your self. And it's just not healthy. So he says, forgive 70 times 7. I venture to say there's not anybody in here that's been hurt 70 times 7 times in a day by somebody. It doesn't happen. So every time, he's basically saying every time you let them go. It, it just when they ask, nope, every time. You forgive it every time. Uh, the next one is Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. <clears throat> and it says, You've heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. So this is kind of, um, I don't know, going back to maybe revenge. I don't know. He's basically saying if someone hurts you, 
if someone hits you on that one cheek, you, you turn the other cheek. So it's not, it's not seeking revenge. It's not seeking. It's not make even in the score. And that's what the world does. We, they like to even the score. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. Even in marriages, he hurts me, I'm going to hurt him. It may be just a little jab, and it may be a word, but just enough to, you know, push his button, whatever it is. That's, that's not what this says here. It says, if someone slaps you on one cheek, you turn to the other cheek. Does that make sense to our minds? No. It sounds like we're being fools, doesn't it? That's what the word says. And we have a choice whether or not to follow his ways. Because following him, taking up our cross, is following his ways. The next one is Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. It says, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. So I told you it was going to get, not only are you supposed to forgive them, but you're supposed to pray for them. You're supposed to pray for them and not just to God bless them. You're supposed to pray for them. You're supposed to love them, enemies, not just, not just you know, somebody that might have hurt your enemies, people that are, have truly you have been hurt by. Love them. Pray for them. The golden rule in Matthew chapter 7, do to others what you would like them to do to you, not what they do to you. That's opposite, isn't it? That's opposite of what the world, the world's, you know, you do that to me, I do that to you. Sounds fair. It's not what God says. He said, do to others what you want them to do to you. Very opposite. Let's turn to this one. Romans chapter 14, verse 13. It says, So stop being critical and condemning of other believers, but instead determine to never deliberately cause a brother or sister to stumble and fall because of your actions. I know and am convinced by personal revelation from the Lord Jesus that there is nothing wrong with eating any food. And then skip down to verse 21. It says, The right thing to do is to keep from eating meat, drinking wine, or doing anything else that will make other believers fall. Following God, sometimes I said earlier, you're going to have to give up your rights. Sometimes there are things that we do that biblically there's nothing wrong with. But if it's if it's causing a a, another Christian, another person to stumble or to fall, right here Jesus is saying, give it up, give it up. God said, I mean Paul, Paul saying, give it up. It's not worth it, you know. But that's my right. But if I want to have a drink whenever, you know, it's just a drink. I don't get drunk. It's just whatever. But I'm around people that could could cause them to stumble. Is it right? I don't know. You're going to have to listen to the Holy Spirit, and he will be very clear. If he's telling us not to cause another brother to stumble, he's going to speak to you when you're causing somebody else to stumble. And we don't want to do that. That's one of his ways. Um, All right, I'm going to really peruse through these last few, and then I want to give you a testimony. Um, and so our lives, success, uh, Matthew 20, 25 talks about, it says, it says, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you want to be great, have you, have you heard that song? If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the greatest servant of all or something like that. That's what the scripture is talking about. It's not the person that has the most money. It's not the person that has the best job. It's not the person that has the status. It's who? The servant. It's completely flipped from the word of God. I mean, from the world. It's completely flipped. The greatest in God's kingdom is the servant. Uh, the next one, this is um, something that the world will never understand. Um, this, have you ever heard the king about the story about King Jehoshaphat? Uh, he was a very good king of Israel, and Israel was booming. Everything was going good, and he got word that there were several armies that were coming to attack them. And the Bible said he became very terrified at the thought of it, and he sought the Lord. And then it says he got up in front of all of Israel, and what's the first thing he began to do? He began to talk to them, and he began to talk to God and remind the people of Israel all of the things that God had already done for them. He, he reminded them of the time he had delivered them and brought them through the, you know, everything, all, of, all that he had done. 
And it says after that that there was a man in the congregation that stood up and he said, listen here, he said, you're not going to have to fight this battle today. He said, I'm going to fight this battle for you. And so let's, we're going to pick up here in Second Chronicles chapter 20. It says, at the very moment they began to sing and give praise. So here they are. They appointed singers and they're walking out to, where the, to meet these armies that are coming to attack them. They appointed singers to walk out in front of them. And it says, at the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start, to start fighting among themselves. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. And after they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of, of the enemies had escaped. King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder. They found vast amounts of equipment, clothing, and other valuables, more than they could carry. There was so much plunder that it took them three days just to collect it all. And on the fourth day, they gathered in the Valley of Blessing, which got its name that day, because the people praised and thanked the Lord there. It is still called the Valley of Blessing today. So one thing that the world, it's opposite. Sometimes you're, you're, not, res, you're not responsible for fighting your battle. And... A lot of the battles that you're, um, that we are needing to war against is asking us to do exactly what this is, is just praise God and trust him. And that's completely against what the word of God, I mean, what the world thinks, because, you know, you're supposed to fight your own battles. I mean, how many of you heard that? Fight? I'm going to fight my own battle. That's not what God says here. That's not, the, you know, even Paul and Silas, they were arrested for ministering and preaching and telling people about Jesus and they were thrown in prison and we talked about this Sunday in kids church it was not a fa fancy cushy prison prison it was a horrible prison and here they are it says around the midnight hour what were they doing praising singing and what happened we know that the Bible said a great earthquake happened and flew open whose doors not just Paul and Silas it said every door in the jail flew open. So praise, pr telling God who he is and thanking him for who he is, is the most powerful weapon we have. It's completely against, and so if, if you're not using that, that's a way of God. That's one of his ways. If you're not using it and you're, and you're dealing with battles, you're going to keep dealing with those battles until you decide, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do God the way God is telling me to do it. And a lot of times, that's what he's going to be telling you to do. There's too many scriptures in the Bible that talk about how praise is a weapon. Uh, Joshua and the Battle of Jericho is another one. I didn't go into that one. And so, these are, these are all ways of God. And when we, when we choose to follow God, we're choosing his ways. We're saying... We're saying, I really like that. I really like, I really want to follow, you know, just like we would if we were going to follow somebody on Instagram. I really want to follow them. I like, I like their product. And so I'm going to choose to follow them. I want to be like them. I want to replicate them. I want to, I want to imitate them. When we choose to follow God, we're going to have to replicate his ways. We're going to have to imitate his ways. We're going to have to choose that his ways, we're going to have to choose his ways above our ways. We're going to have to put ourselves down, and decide that, let me read that again, because I love that, that the last line in that uh, thing, it says, and instead of his will, self-interest now rules, and what I want reigns, so if I'm going to choose God's ways, I'm going to have to abase myself, and what I want, and what I desire, and everything that has to do with me, in order to follow his ways. And so I was, uh, I was sharing this with the praise and worship team. And I'll give this testimony before we close. Um, a few weeks ago, I was sitting in church on a Sunday morning. Praise and worship was amazing. I was totally into it. And out of nowhere, and when I'm telling you out of nowhere, that's how quick, and you guys will know this. Um, I got super, I should say super, I got offended with something. Uh, and, I, and I recognized it because when you've dealt with offense before, you tend to be very cautious of it after that because you see the destruction it causes. So I, I recognized it, and I, it didn't take me very long to deal with it, and I dealt with it pretty quick. And I was so thankful 
now. Let me, uh, this is going to be a testimony, so it's going to look like I'm going, yay, Aaron did all this right. There are so many things I haven't done right. But in this testimony, because it is a testimony, I'm going to tell you the things I did do right, okay? And the product that came from it. And so I put the fence down, walked away, chose to believe the best, and walked away from it. But that wasn't the end of it. That night, um, something happened with one of my children that caused worry, fear, anxiety, eh, stress, strain. And I let let that eat at me a little longer than the fence. So for about two... About two and a half days, I was really dealing with, with this. And if those of you that have kids, adult kids, let me, ref- let, me let you know. Because last time I told this, Joshua goes, thanks, Mom. You let everybody think it was me. It was not Joshua, so I'm just going to tell you all that up front. <laughs> it was an adult kid, you know. But I was just dealing with stuff with her, and it, it had really taken me down. And I was supposed to teach that night in children's. Um, and I asked, I called Mona. And you need to know that when you're in a position if you don't have a person you can call, not somebody that's going to pet you and pat you and tell you everything's okay, and you don't need that. I don't, I don't want that. And so I, I know who to call. And I, I hope that she doesn't think every time I call her for lunch, I'm always going to call her to pull me out of stuff. But, but I needed something that day, and I knew I did. And so I called her, and we talked and encouraged each other back and forth. And by the time I left that meeting, I... I had cast all of my care. And, I, and, and care for your children is heavy, isn't it? It's very heavy. And I, I successfully had casted all of that care on him. And so I went back to the office that day. And I'm, I'm not a super, I'm not an extrovert at all, at all. Like, if you see a picture of an introvert in a dictionary, that's me. And so it is, it is hard for me to go and, and converse. If people come and talk to me, I'm great, but it's hard for me to approach. And so even people I've worked with, even uh, I work at the transportation department here at Alma Schools, and so I'm around all the bus drivers. And they're so super nice. I mean, even around them, I'll oftentimes just sit in my office when they come in around 2 every day and just work. But this one day, uh, it was a couple of days before I turned 50, and they were harassing me about it. And I heard them out there. So I went out there, and I just engaged. It's good to engage with people. I engaged with them. And while I was out there, there's a, a lady that subs for us, and she was talking about turning 70 this year. And uh, we were teasing her, you know, because she was saying, oh, I just I don't want to turn 70. And, you know, I, I, we were kind of harassed, not, not harassing her, but teasing her. And things got serious real quick, and she's teared up. And she said, my mom and dad both died when they were 71. And she said, I don't want to turn 70. And this fear, you could just see, you could see the spirit of fear on her as she just sat there and tears streamed and all these men sitting around her. And for those of you that are wondering, there are a lot of good Christian people in the Alma School District. And so um, a lot of our bus drivers sitting there, one of them spoke up and he said, we're going to pray for you. He said, you see all these people around you, we're going to lift you up in prayer. And you know, something came up in me and said, and I just leaned over and I said, I said, Karen, can we pray for you right now? And, I, you know, that I know that sounds so, I should be further along than that in my spiritual life. That was a big thing for me because normally I'd be in my office not engaged. I wouldn't have even been a part of the conversation. and wouldn't have known that there was somebody out there that needed to know, needed that spirit of fear broken off of her and someone that knew how to do it, someone that knew the authority they carried. And so we prayed and she came back a couple of days later and she said, thank you so much. You have no idea what that meant. You have no idea what it did for me. So, so praise report number one. But like I said, if I had been caught up in myself, and if I had been still thinking about my daughter, and all, or if, or if I had still been way back at step one and been completely offended, there is no telling where I would have been. And I promise you, I would not have been there to help her. So later that night, I got here a little bit early, and I went into the kids room and I just shut the doors and I, there wasn't hardly anybody here and I turned the praise and worship on and I just began to praise and worship God and set the atmosphere for the room for when the kids came in and the Holy Spirit was so precious and so evident that night and um, that night I just felt led very prompted in the middle of service to talk to the kids about the postures of worship 
And I didn't, you know, even when it came up in my spirit, I thought, are they going to understand this? They're only like eight, nine years old, you know, but that's what I felt. I, and I, I talked to them about different postures of worship and, and how worship's supposed to look and what we're supposed to do and why we do it. And then we played a song and I'm, I'm worshiping. I have my hands raised and I just, the whole time I'm thinking, I don't, you know, I'm just wondering what they're doing. And I opened my eyes to see every single kid in that building off to their selves. Some of them were knelt down with their hands lifted up. Some of them were standing there praising, but not a one. And you have no idea how big of a praise report this is. Not a one of them were goofing off with each other because they're kids. Not a one. And they were, they were truly, and I want to read a, later that um, week, a parent messaged me on Facebook, and she said, Thank you for ministering to my children last night. One of them shared with me that the Holy Spirit laid the day and night, night and day, let incense arise song on your heart. Number one, that's one of our favorites. Number two, she said she needed it along with what you shared right before. She was struggling with something in class, and you opened up her mail. I explained that God is so good, and when he saw the struggle in her heart, he used you to bring her peace and wisdom on how to get over it. And that blessed me. This little 11-year-old girl needed something that night from me. And if I had been caught up in myself, which is his goal, (laughs) it is Satan's goal. Remember, he doesn't care if you worship him. He wants you to worship yourself. And if I had been caught up in myself and what I didn't have and what was bothering me and what was troubling me, and if I had not chosen his ways of Number one, not getting offended. Number two, casting cares. All of that. Then those two people I know for sure would not have been ministered to that night by me. I wouldn't have been able to get the joy of doing it. And and then I thought, and I was so happy, and then I got home that night and I thought, how many people have I missed by being caught up in myself and not choosing to follow him, really follow him? Because really following him is putting myself down and lifting his ways up. No matter what I think or believe about him, choosing his ways over my ways every time. And so I just encourage you tonight. I know my time's up, and I just, but I, and I, was, I told you there's a bunch of scripture. I was trying to rush through it. But um, I just want to encourage you really, really ask God what it, what it looks like to be a follower of him. Because we, we're, you know, you've heard the word term all your life, playing church. I don't want to play church anymore. There's people's lives. There's people in here that are counting on us not playing church anymore. I want, I want, to, I want to follow him. I want to serve him. I want to do his ways, even if it means giving up everything I have, my time, my effort, my energy. You know, I just committed to serve back in the, to be a coordinator back there because Kylie was over a bazillion things, and I committed to take a plate off of her. I didn't feel, I, and I told him that when I accepted it. I told him, I said, they asked if I was willing to do it, and I said, are you okay? You know, before when people would ask me if I do stuff, I always had a draw. There was always something in me that was like, oh, yes. But this time, it was just like, I can do it. I know I can. I've done it before. I know I can do it, and it's going to take something off your plate so you can minister in another area. So, yeah, I'll do it. And I said, if you're okay with it being that, with me saying, I see a need, I I commit to do it, instead of, I am so passionate about it. Did you know sometimes that's that's okay? So you're not going to be passionate about everything God asks you to do? Most of the things you're not going to be passionate about it, actually. And that's okay. It's just choosing to say yes, giving up yourself, your time. There's a lot of time that goes into being a coordinator, a lot of effort, a lot of planning and scheduling and writing curriculum. There's things that go into it. There's a lot of things that God's asked you to do that you're giving up time for, God will honor it every time. And you're gonna, and he's going to bring people when he knows he can trust you. He's going to bring people in your path for you to minister to. I know he already does. But love you guys. I don't know. I hope that wasn't harsh because really I was speaking to me. So anyway, thank you. Oh, sorry. Just, yep. Anybody? Well, that's, good. that's so good. So good. Thank you, Miss Aaron. Wow, that was so good. You know, um, we're gonna we're closing. That was a close. Uh, but she said something that seemed very uh, at the end that would be very good 
to leave with tonight. And she said, set the atmosphere. And what she was talking about was setting. You know, when you, and she's talking all about serving others. And one of the first things you teach your kids to do to serve others is what you do every day. You eat and you teach them how to set the table to serve others, you know. And I don't know, um, I think this is just so good to make this point again. She went into that room to set the atmosphere so that others could receive there. And it's just, this is one of the number one things we that just in our heart as we're coming into this new year and just what the Lord's been dealing and talking about about in this house, getting things in order. Um, it's so important for you to set the atmosphere of your home. Um, every male in here, I want you to stand up. Every male. All right. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you to set the atmosphere. Figure out how. Figure out what words need to be spoken. Ask the Lord what needs to be bound. Turn off programming that shouldn't be on. I'm not talking about porn. I'm talking about programming. Any kind of programming, TVs, that needs to not be on, ask the Lord. What songs are to be in your homes? Are there songs in your homes? I don't know how to run that. Find out how. Set the atmosphere. You lead. You're anointed to do that. You're anointed to do that. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for what you're doing in this house. And as the leaders and the heads of the home, just as you came to show us what it looks like to serve, I thank you right now for just an anointing to serve, to serve well. Help us set the atmosphere of our homes so that others would receive in fullness who you are. And this doesn't just go for the males. This also goes for you here if you're a single mom or you are the caretaker of your home. I want you to know the, you are equipped from the Lord to set the atmosphere of your home so that others can receive fully what God desires them to have. Amen. That was just felt so strong in my heart. And um, isn't that cool? We get to serve our kids. We get to serve our family. We get to set the table. And you can just get with the Lord. And and um, can I tell you, ladies, don't tell them how to take out the trash. What I mean by that is this. I'm not talking about trash there. I'm talking about don't tell them how to lead. Don't tell them how to lead and how to follow the Lord and do it this way. You might as well let them walk away. Don't tell them how to lead. They're anointed by the Lord to lead. And there are things that um, sometimes we think we know, but we're not given that anointing and responsibility or call. And then again, if we're going to go back to what Pastor Aaron, or if I say Pastor Aaron, Pastor Rodney and Aaron, these are my, they were youth pastors here, and I still, that's how I always still refer to them because they truly care for people and shepherd and help oversee. Um, but this is what the Bible says in this uh, politically correct, you know, feminist culture. This is not to degrade or anything, honor, to lift up, to love. Our, our wives are amazing gifts. But you also have to stand in the office as the man that God said. When things come in order, that's when things flow down. So anyway, sometimes there's just some work. I just believe God's wanting to get some things in order. Uh, and I believe that, um, you know, the men standing here tonight, 
um, it's important that you see that I am anointed to lead my family. We say it this way, to serve my family, to set the table, to set the atmosphere of my home. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you guys Sunday morning.